and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today, I'm particularly pleased uh, to welcome, for the first time, a guest to the Westminster Institute, Dr. Sanan Siddhi, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies here in Washington, DC. He is an expert on Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy. He is also an associate professor of national security studies at Marine Corps University. Prior to joining that institution, Sanan was the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies based at Georgetown University. Between 2008 and 2011, he established the Turkish Studies Program at the University of Florida's Center for European Studies. He continues to serve as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Sanan was born in Turkey and educated in the United Kingdom. He obtained his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 2007 in the field of political science. He was previously an instructor at Sabanji University near Istanbul between 2004 and 2008 and completed his postdoctoral fellowship at the same institution. Distinct from his articles and opinion editorials, his book titled Kemalism in Turkish Politics, the Republican People's Party, Secularism and Nationalism, focuses on the electoral weakness of the Republican People's Party. Dr. Sidi is joining me today to discuss what does President Erdogan's election victory mean for Turkey and the world? Sinan, thank you so much. Welcome to the Westminster Institute. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for the introduction and uh, happy to be here. Maybe we should just start with a discussion of the election itself, which many have uh, characterized as free but not fair. And when I was uh, surveying the press reports of the election, I was, uh, let us say, well, not totally surprised by Erdogan's near total control of the media, but also blocking text messages from his principal opponent doctoring videos to misrepresent the views of his opponent and other you know pretty nasty tricks uh what's your take on that free but not fair characterization so i think this is a particularly sort of poignant inflection point in turkish politics because i think since the early 2010s what we've started to see by election by election is this sort of creeping authoritarianism whereby the rules of the game and the accessibility of opponents to media airtime or just the ability to be able to convey their sort of message to voters of all persuasions so that voters can have an, make an informed choice before choosing who to vote for has been slowly but surely sort of chipped away in the last decade or so. But I think what you're pointing to is the sort of culmination point uh, this time around, whereby it really is very stark in terms of just how uh, unfair and uneven the playing field has been for the Turkish opposition in order to be able to reach audiences. I think, you know, you can look at this from different ways and you pointed to an interesting one in terms of, you know, the main opposition candidates text messages being sort of prevented from being sent out. Take what you will, but I've got another interesting one whereby the state broadcaster, which is obligated to essentially cover all political campaigns and provide, a re you know, an equal amount of airtime to, to, to all candidates running for office at the presidential level. For Erdogan, in, uh, uh, in the month leading up to the May 14 first round election, the state broadcaster gave over 32 hours of broadcast time. His main opponent, Mr. Kılıç Thoroğlu of the opposition Republican People's Party, he was let given less than 32 minutes. So just to give you a sort of a comparison by, you know, in terms of how much time they got, it's quite stark. Now, I should also be fair and say, look, it doesn't really matter how much time anybody gets on the state broadcaster, because how many people watch the state channel in terms of like getting their news? Not many. But on, on the cable side, whereby if you can imagine all TV stations and Turkey's television sort of broadcast sort of service and the cable service is not that different from the United States, whereby, you know, you can scroll down for minutes on end from channel to channel to channel and multiple news outlets. But 
you know, most of those are very pro Erdogan um, because they've been co-opted um, into being purchased by pro Erdogan media moguls. And even those private channels have severely limited the amount of airtime that the opposition has gotten to essentially broadcast their election message. So, you know, on just the media front, I would say the political opposition has been sort of closeted and siloed into using just a couple of TV sort of outlets to essentially broadcast its message, as well as sort of these some of these web based sort of outlets. But it's interesting, the two main broadcasters and the US viewers might find this kind of intriguing that gave airtime to the opposition candidate is Rupert Murdoch's Fox TV in Turkey. And unlike its US equivalent, Fox TV in Turkey is extremely progressive and what US viewers might come to know as liberal, which is kind of antithetical to what, what, what we find in, in the US. And the other one's an outlet called Hulk TV, which has essentially become an opposition broadcasting channel. But other than that, it's been very hard for the Coach Roll campaign to get its message out there. But there are other factors too. So it's not just the media playing field, you know, like governors and district governors have been sort of told to, to sort of, you know, uh, ensure that, you know, Erdogan's campaign gets mo- much more reception and organization in provinces where campaign rallies have been held. Even social media was somewhat sort of restricted. Elon Musk actually put out a message saying prior to the elections that he would restrict the amount of sort of critical messages of Erdogan being displayed simply because if he did not cooperate with the Turkish government, that Twitter was going to be completely blocked in Turkey. So he sort of put out the message saying he had no choice. But, you know, make of that as you will. But yes, it's, 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 it's been you know, a highly sort of stifling environment if you are an opponent of Erdogan to get your message out. But on the other hand, there seemed to be a fair amount of excitement because there had to be a runoff election. And the opposition candidate put together a coalition of parties, including the Kurds in Turkey, and was predicted by some polls as the winner. Now, I neglected to mention that Erdogan has been in power for the past 20 years as either prime minister or president. And during that time, he has consolidated control over every government institution in Turkey, the courts, the executive branch, the military, etc. So it would, it would have seemed highly unlikely that he could lose. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. So there was very much a heightened expectation that this might be the time or the occasion when Erdogan will finally lose and be sort of relegated to political retirement or face legal jeopardy given his 21 years in office uh, with numerous sort of, you know, outstanding sort of uh, 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 cases against him, not least of all corruption, abuse of power, but also other sort of uh, uh, sort of things built up in his chest over time. Uh, that being said, you're, you know, you pointed to some of the most, you know, uh, critical things. Now let's, and then reason why, you know, there was an assumption or an overwhelming sort of belief that he might be voted out was not altogether unfair. Look, the country is really facing down the barrel of a runaway economy, right? And which, you know, and that was seen to be the most determinative factor that would result in his political demise simply because, uh, Turkey has been running triple digit inflation for the last year and a half now. Uh, and by some reckonings, it is the second or third highest level of inflation in the world after places like Venezuela. It's supposed to be down to about 40% right now, but nobody believes that. And they think the actual rate of inflation is still close to 100% a year. And salaries aren't exactly uh, rising. Uh, unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, is exploding. Right now, total unemployment seems to be about 10%, but it's likely to be much higher than that if, they, if, if it was actually properly recorded and the information not suppressed. The Turkish currency, due to sort of very unorthodox policies pursued by Erdogan, has compounded this problem of economic malaise, whereby what you are seeing is the Turkish lira has lost over 60 to 65% of its actual value against the US dollar in the past 18 months, which is just unbelievable. And even since May 14, the election, the first round, it's lost about 7% of its value. And Erdogan has been spending down treasury, uh, the central bank funds, uh, and just selling off dollars into, in, in, into, the, into the markets, basically so as to stop people buying up the dollars uh, and stabilizing the Turkish currency against it. But now that's even empty. And right now, as you can actually probably track this online, as, as you view this, but the Turkish lira continues to slip by the dollar because they don't have the means to prop it up by selling dollars. 
consumer price inflation, you know, things like electric bills, everything, everything that's part of the staple life of Turks has been getting measurably worse. It's quite miserable. You know, it's, it's really hard to admit. Many people thought, well, this is it. He cannot weather this. And then at the beginning of February, we had a series of devastating earthquakes. And the government really mismanaged the emergency response to that, delays in getting aid out there. It affected almost 10 million people in, in southeastern Turkey across 14 provinces, and not to mention all the relatives and loved ones across other you know, unaffected provinces who are angry with the government, right? But it also laid to bear the amount of corruption and nepotism and cronyism that the government has been sort of implementing for the last uh, you know 20 plus years whereby you know the implementation of building codes and zoning and all this sort of stuff it seems to have been haphazardly trampled over by by the Erdogan government so people really did think well this is it I mean you cannot basically you know yes Turkey has taken a, a, a severe authoritarian turn under Erdogan and, and some of the things that you mentioned in terms of political sort of repression uh, over the years but given that there are still elections and people have a choice to make, and there are two distinct candidates, one is severely anti Erdogan, that you know he could not weather these challenges, and he did. And so it makes you wonder, well, what are some of these causes? I think one of the most unforeseen sort of elements is um, Erdogan's campaigning strategy, in addition to sort of these media pressures and less than free and fair conditions. So those are important. But I think the other thing to underline is what Erdogan was very skillful at was saying, okay, let me appeal to a voter profile, right? And say, not underline or harp on about uh, how to manage this bad economy, but let me play upon people's fears, divisions, and fault lines in Turkish society. And basically what he did was essentially suggest that, look, if you vote for the other guy, then essentially our country will be weaker. It will be overrun by uh, you know, Kurdish terrorists and separatists that will divide our country. It will be a vote for essentially you know, American imperialism. A vote for the other guy will essentially mean that you won't get your pension bumps and salary increases for public employees, et cetera, et cetera. So he really did touch upon some of the fault lines that divide Turkish society. And in the end, it seems to have proven just enough because he got 52% out of 48% of the popular vote at the end in the second round of balloting, it's not a huge margin of victory, but it's sufficient. It's hard to say how much of the vote turned over to him because he had his you know, thumb pressed down on the scales with media pressures and, and sort of below the belt tactics in dividing the opposition and playing upon the fault lines of society. But in the end, there have been no serious, you know, substance, substantiated sort of accusations which suggest there was any malfeasance in the, in, in the outcome of the election. But in the past, isn't it true that uh, outcomes of certain elections have been highly suspect? When the AKP candidate is losing, uh, vote counts are suspended, and when they resume, all of a sudden he's winning. And then you've got the constitutional referendum, which changed Turkey from a parliamentarian into a presidential system. Do you think it's fair to say the, the outcome of uh, that vote counting was suspect? Look, there are sort of legitimate suspicions out there, right? There is certainly sort of, you know, in, a, in any sort of what I would call functioning democratic country where the rule of law was supreme. Let's just say, you know, for the sake of example, the United States, where there have been, you know, numerous investigations into the outcome of a couple of the last two presidential elections, right, or midterms, right, where, you know, you know, independent uh, investigations are carried out by numerous bodies, which determined, you know, overall, by and large, there, you know, there's been so little fraud that the outcome of both presidential and midterm elections has been basically secure. And voter fraud, as sort of being that's been put out there, is actually kind of baseless. It really hasn't done anything. In the case of Turkey, the best I can say is it's unknown, simply because there is no independent investigation which can actually corroborate what actually happened. And you correctly suggest in the past elections, in the previous presidential election, for example, the main news agency which reports uh, tabulated election results from the Supreme Election Council, the body in Turkey which tabulates the results officially, the official body, right? The reporting from that was certainly, as you suggest, called into question and rightfully so, because as the count was being reported, it came to a sort of an abrupt stop at certain periods of the night, and then it started to continue again, only to Erdogan's advantage. So people are saying, hang on a minute, what really happened there? 
is there some malfeasance? The, 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 the problem, however, is, is there's no body, investigative body. There's no independent courts. There's no independent judiciary at this point with which to essentially determine what happened. And that's certainly unusual for Turkey, I should say. I should also underline that, you know, prior to, to the 2010s, when Erdogan really centralized power, again, as you suggest, under this presidential system, and really co-opted and captured the courts and the judiciary and made it sort of compliant to his will, Look, uh, you know, Turkey was always reputed by by both internal and in, uh, external monitors and observers, whereby, you know, it held free and fair elections uh, with very minor sort of detracting sort of incidences. And right now, what I can say definitely is, is unfortunately, we just have no way of knowing, right? And part of that, I think, well, in large part, it really has been compounded and made worse by this presidential system. You know, Turks basically voted in a referendum and you can argue did what did they really have an informed knowledge of what they were being asked to vote on a referendum for i would argue they didn't they were just simply given a yes or no question should turkey be transformed into a you know transition into a parliament presidential system you know people weren't sure why not um you know nobody really took time to read this this presidential system in turkey is you know unlike ours here or pretty much unlike most presidential systems in democratic states that you can think of. You know, you know, imagine a presidency, let's say ours here in the United States, whereby the president's word was final, where the president could actually decree or you know, promulgate reg- legislation independent of Congress, and it would have carry the full force of law. And then imagine if the courts in the United States had no ability to challenge those laws. That, that were decreed by the president to annul them or you know, say that they were anti- unconstitutional, right? The president's word in Turkey is final. He can bypass parliament. Parliament can still legislate, but Erdogan as president or any president succeeds him doesn't really have to, to essentially listen to parliament. And in some respects, what the critics say is, look, the Turkish parliament has been transformed into a debate club. That's pretty much it. It has no real power. The buck pretty much stops with the president. The only exception being if they want to exact uh, constitutional changes in Turkey, that still requires parliamentary numbers. But Erdogan's not really concerned with that right now. He pretty much can wake up tomorrow and say, you know, I decree that all Turkish citizens have to wear yellow jackets for five days, and that becomes law, and nobody can challenge or overturn that. Well, he has control of the parliament anyway from the election results, correct? Correct, yeah. His, his, his... His majority alliance, it's not just by his own party, but he, it's, it's an alliance of parties that hold a parliamentary majority now. That majority has shrunk since the 2018 elections, you know, to be on, you know, to be fair and clear. But yes, he still has about 322 seats in that alliance out of the total 600, which gives him an, a, a majority, just albeit a slim one. So it will be interesting to see how, you know, he will manage this he doesn't necessarily want to decree laws. He likes to say that, you know, laws were passed by parliament. He usually likes saving decrees for like, mid, you know, Friday midnight sort of dumps. You know, if he's going to replace the central bank governor or if he's going to appoint a new governor for a big city or some major executive position that he wants to announce. He doesn't want to get that through parliament. He basically says, I decree this. It's published on a late. If it's an unpopular or challenging controversial decision, that's what he likes. But he would like to be able to pass on the ordinary business of legislating to parliament simply because then he can say to the external world, well, you know, the parliament has acted and, when I'm, you know, and that's, that's how it happens. The human rights group in New York, Freedom House, downgraded its rating for Turkey in 2018 from partly free to not free. Do you agree with that assessment? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, the, you know, the fundamental problem with Turkey right now is that it is not a society which is no lot which is you know ruled by well the rule of law um this is the fundamental problem with the country and again this is not the sort of you know modus operandi for turkey i mean turks since 1950 essentially when the country sort of you know entered the, the era of competitive free politics where you know people could vie for power but also throughout Turkey's sort of a transition throughout the Cold War as a, and its engagement with the European Union and a, an attempted accession to the European Union really did overhaul a, you know, its, 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 its governance system to become more EU compliant. So historically speaking, certainly since in my sort of childhood and my earlier years and, and up until recently, you know, Turkey was a model democracy, but it was a country which was by and large 
a country based on laws and, 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 and a relative independence of the courts and a relative sort of independent judiciary. And I would even say, you know, again, it's not, you know, it's not a bastion of democracy where the, you know, press freedoms exist on a level of the United States. But again, in comparison to today, press freedoms were pretty, you know, uh, available to, to mass media in Turkey until Erdogan really sort of reined these in. So I would say, you know, if, if you look across the country, the number of political prisoners, the people who've just been banged up in prison because of things like insulting the president, right, um, which I've never seen as, you know, until Erdogan came to power, it was never a sort of a law. You, the worst that Turkey had was you could go, you could be fined or like fa fa face sort of, uh, in theory, prison time for insulting Ataturk. That's always been on the statute books. But in, in past, before Erdogan, you know, insulting prime ministers or presidents, um, you know, that was never an issue. But today, you know, particularly since the coup attempt, Erdogan has used sort of these strength and securitization laws to essentially really undermine any political opposition to basically maintain his his regime at this point, such that, you know, you know, Freedom House's deliberation does not come lightly. And that political sort of determination of not being a free country also takes its economic toll. I mean, it's really, you know, that 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 lack of rule of law has basically dried up foreign investments in Turkey. A headline case, for example, back in 2019, Volkswagen was going to be another sort of multinational that was going to open a, a new plant inside of Turkey, an investment of, you know, a couple of billion dollars of investment. It finally pulled out and decided to go elsewhere simply because they looked at this thing and said, sure, I mean, Turkey's a great country to have this manufacturing base in. Uh, but it's a little too hot because there is no fundamental rule of law. So we're going to take our business elsewhere. Inbound sort of portfolios of investment have dried up too, simply because just, you know, a lack of accountability, a lack of transparency and a lack of, you know, democratic governance has basically not just been limited to political consequences, but it's starting to have its economic toll too. You make a very good point that early in Erdogan's rule uh, from, say, the, you know, past 2001 for a decade, Turkey prospered. I, for a period of 10 years, it had an economic growth rate of something like seven and a quarter percent. Turks got richer. Turkey was looked to as a model of a Muslim majority country that had a liberal democratic constitutional regime that it perhaps could be the model for, and of course, you, you mentioned the attempt for EU accession, the reforms that were made to bring it into serious consideration. But then, uh, you know, Putin in his uh, early stages of his rule uh, was also a reformer. The, the anti-Americanism that uh, surfaced later was not there. After 9-11, he offered Russian air bases and intelligence help. He stabilized the Russian economy and initiated a period of growth, and then, uh, you know, slowly but surely turned toward greater authoritarianism. And some people say Putin has become Erdogan's model in that sense, that he's, he's not at the stage that Putin is in Russia, but he, that's, that's the direction in which he, he is going and would like to go. Now, you mentioned a series of domestic problems that in any normal political situation uh, would have made the incumbent candidate toast, as we say. The famous mantra from the uh, President Clinton's campaign years ago is, it's the economy stupid. You wrote an article recently in Foreign Policy stating that if you, that's what you're looking at in this Turkish election, you, you're, you're not understanding the dynamic of it at all. And you've repeated some of what you said in, in your discussion so far. But these huge problems you mentioned, the earthquakes, 50,000 people dead, the, the faulty build, building codes, the slow uh, reconstruction efforts, the runaway inflation, the state of the economy. Doesn't he have to do something about these now? Uh, he's got another five years. He can't really blame anybody else. Are there, are there any uh, indications from this early part of his new administration that he will do something? For instance, he recently appointed Mehmet Shinshek 
in, in the cabinet who has a good reputation uh, for uh, economic management and more conventional policies uh, con concerning money supply and interest rates. Is, is that a indication that Erdogan may leave this, this uh, contrary economic policy of lowering interest rates when you have runaway inflation? So it depends what he wants. Um, I'm actually worried um, and that expectations should be tempered. Look, Erdogan, this is the first election that he has been candidate as pr candidate Erdogan, where he's faced a, 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 a negative growing economy. Since 2002, uh, since he stood for positions, he has always presided over a growing economy. And that has basically allowed him to grow a base uh, his, his base of vote voters, right? He is, because of Turkey's growth, he's been able to sort of grow his Justice and Development Party voter base to almost one out of two voters um, back in 2011, right? And at that time, you know, he, you know, people voted for the party, not the person, although Erdogan embodied, you know, much of the success of that. You're right. Between 2002 to 2012, Turkish national income per capita quintuple to about twelve to thirteen thousand dollars per per capita, really pushing it up into the sort of the foothold of becoming a strong G uh, a, a G twenty country. Um, and so at that time, I think the goal was to essentially grow that tent. Right, it, it was a big tent party that was intended to essentially, you know, uh, distribute uh, gro economic growth more equitably throughout society. Uh, what it's what's happening now is I don't necessarily believe that he has any intentions of, you know, seriously bringing back Turkey to this sort of uh, uh, orthodox policy, uh, economic sort of model whereby he's going to go back to the factory settings of Erdogan, which is a you know an you know an equitable economic growth system which benefits everybody. Um, and the reason why I say that is because he ran an, uh, an economic campaign. Oh, sorry, an election campaign that he wasn't selling an economy on. He was selling him, himself to hold on to power. And that says a few things. Um, and you're right. He's adopted Mehmet Shimshek, which is a sort of, you know, a, a big credible name. Uh, he presided over a significant portion of economic growth in the earlier years of Erdogan. Uh, and the reason why he's adopted him into this, into this new cabinet is to sort of give this veneer of credibility to international investors and the international audiences, right? Um, so that they can see Turkey as an investment grade country again. So, you know, if Erdogan was serious about putting the economy, strengthening the economy, uh, the appointment of Shimshek is correct, right? If he gives him free reign, right? To say, okay, you do what you need to do and I'm not going to interfere. But what that would also need that would follow up with is essentially is raising interest rates, right, at the minimum, right? It would also mean uh, granting independence, complete independence, which Turkey had for a long time, to the central bank and its ability to set monetary policy. It would then, under normal circumstances, given the state of the Turkish economy, if you're interested in international investment and basically want to signal to the international financial community that you're serious about reform and, and prudence, that you would basically approach the International Monetary Fund and say, look, I'm in dire trouble here. You know, Turkey's collection of internal and external debt is, is close to about $700 billion. It's unheard of. And it really does need major assistance. So that's why I'm saying if Turkey was serious about this, it would go knocking on the doors of the IMF. I don't think Erdogan's going to do that. Because in order to approach the IMF, you have to open up the books. You have to show the IMF how the government spends its money, how it taxes it, how it puts it to use. And Erdogan has not done or sort of disclosed government spending or subjected itself to government spending audits since 2012. That's all been suppressed, right? And instead, what he's done in, in order to attract capital is strike up these personal relationships with a handful of states, mostly essentially located in the Gulf, in the Arabian Gulf. So we've seen deposits into the Turkish Central Bank of 5 billion here, 10 billion here by entities such as Qatar, and now the UAE, but also Saudi Arabia at times. The Russians, for example, have suspended 
payment of about 20 to 25 billion dollars worth of natural gas imports right so he's really sort of doing this piecemeal and that basically kept the economy up until now uh, flowed up until now he has given no indication right that he's going to walk away from that sort of piecemeal approach of personal relationships and really get serious about sort of you know putting a prudent macroeconomic management that's accountable transparent and you know weeding out corruption i think what he's going to do is give shimshek a bit of leeway to essentially put cosmetic changes to the economy and the management of the economy for the next six to 10 months, right? Or even probably less than that. Because the other thing that's on the horizon for in front of Erdogan's eyes is winning back cities in local elections, specifically the big major cities, especially Istanbul, which he lost back in 2019. And you would think, well, why is that so important? Well, because Istanbul alone is responsible for 25% of Turkey's GDP output. And not controlling that means not controlling the distribution of spoils to cronies, you know, zoning, land grants, building permits, all this sort of stuff, and ability to distribute that to his regime holders. So months before the local elections, my guess is, is he's going to basically stop Shimshek in his tracks and say, thanks for everything that you've done, Right. And then turn on the taps to essentially woo big city voters to essentially ensure that those municipalities return back to his AKP, his Justice and Development Party fold, so that he can essentially continue to manage in, in an authoritarian way. Now, this is all speculation on my part, but it's based on the notion that if he was actually interested in economic jurisprudence and sort of you know, level-headed orthodoxy that would attract sustainable and equitable international investment and growth, that he would walk back these sort of unorthodox policies permanently and reestablish the rule of law. I don't see any indication that that's, that's happening or will happen. I think a lot of this is cosmetic, and we just have to see where he's going to take this. Well, you mentioned some of the uh, support he's gotten from Gulf states, uh, Saudi Arabia, especially Qatar. And I was looking at some of the Qatari press reaction to Erdogan's re-election, which was really over the top, comparing him to the founder of the Ottoman Empire, uh, that that is a measure of Erdogan's greatness. So the, the, uh, the positive response from Qatari press is almost hysterical. Now, the one country you didn't mention that has helped Erdogan uh, survive this, his financial straits is China. And as you all know, Turkey joined the Belt and Road Initiative and China has helped it with swaps yes. uh, in, in its current uh, currency difficulties. Now, that brings us to the, the subject of the foreign policy consequences of Erdogan's victory. Let's talk about China's relationship with Turkey and with, of course, with Erdogan personally, and whether it will continue its kind of support. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. Yes, Turkey is officially part of the BRI. And Turkey has benefited nominally out of these sort of currency swaps, which has been Erdogan's go-to to essentially secure hard currency and financial current, you know, backing to essentially fill up you know, uh, the treasury, which he then spends almost immediately on propping up the local currency by selling off this hard currency into, and flooding the markets with currency, which gets bought up immediately. In his next sort of government term, I expect to see a lot more of this in terms of you know, allowing more access to the Chinese to essentially not just the Chinese, but everybody who's interested in having a piece of the economic pie in Turkey. So, for example, one of the things that you know, you know, uh, analysts are suspicious of in order to attract more sort of foreign currency and investment to Turkey, there are a few things left that Erdogan can essentially tap, which is one of them, which is the selling off of some portion of Turkey's sovereign wealth fund, which includes entities such as Turkish Airlines, which is a, it's basically the biggest sort of you know, international brand, as well as a handful of state banks, and other sort of state, major state entities and telecoms and stuff like this, which will bring in a nominal amount of currency, whether that's the Chinese, whether that's the Russians, whether that's that the sort of the, the, the Gulf states in the Middle East, everybody's essentially poised and salivating at, it, salivating at the prospect. The other thing that he's, that sort of people are sort of anxious and suspicious about is the sale of land and assets inside of Turkey. So since his re-election and also before it also, you know, people with means in Turkey have looked at the sort of political and economic landscape and said, well, this is just too crazy. It's too hot and we've had enough. So a lot of these people have been selling up their assets and moving abroad and overseas and acquiring gold and visas from countries such as, for example, Portugal, 
or Malta or Greece or even the United States if they can sort of you know have muster up the capital to do to get to obtain residency. But you know, Erdogan is essentially putting up for sale a lot of these sort of public lands that the government also owns. For example, he wants to build this mega sort of project inside of a town called Canal Istanbul, which will artificially connect the Black Sea with the Mediterranean. And alongside that canal, you know, is the you know, masses of public land, which is essentially opening up to international buyers, especially from the Arab Peninsula, um, anybody who wants to buy it. And that's his sort of revenue stream without, again, going to more prudent sources. But again, that's going to basically result likely in the short term of massive economic growth because it'll be the construction industry. And as we all know, construction industry is a sugar high. You know, it results in masses, you know, a very short burst of high growth because the building materials get, you know, sold, but, you know, people are hired to build, work on building projects. Then apartments and houses get sold and, you know, factories built and roads built alongside it. And then essentially, you know, it, it does result in, in, in a cycle of growth, which is, a, which is what I think he's aiming at, right? I don't think he's necessarily aiming at, you know, more stable, reliable, and equitable growth that sort of spreads across society, but he wants to be able to essentially sort of induce high high rates of growth and say to the world as well as his voters, see, you know, we can make the economy grow, although uh, essentially that will only benefit a very few people in the country. But it, we don't seem to think he's, he really does care about that. And anybody's a buyer in this game, regardless who it is. And, you know, whether it's, whether it's the Arabs, the Chinese or the Russians, I don't think he cares one way or the other. Well, the, the term used to uh, describe Erdogan's relationships with uh, foreign leaders and foreign states that I see most frequently used is he, he's transactional. Yeah. In other words, he's not guided by a principle. He's just trying to take advantage of the best deal from the best state that he, he can extract. I remember back during the Arab Spring when um, Erdogan, of course, was very close to uh, the Qataris, but he was very pro-Muslim Brotherhood. And that, that, of course, alienated a number of other states in the Middle East, including the Egyptian people and the Saudis. Now that doesn't seem to be such a feature, does it? Even though he, he sort of played the Islamist card uh, in, internally for this election, is he's Drop that in terms of foreign relations, is it or not? So it's interesting, right? So his, you know, he bet big on the Muslim Brotherhood in the region becoming dominant after the Arab uprisings, right? And that has basically fallen by the wayside. You know, he he was a strong proponent of Mohammed Morsi in in Egypt, which you know basically failed. Uh, likewise, he was pretty much a big big fan of that in Tunisia, which also didn't necessarily go anywhere initially. He very much hoped to topple uh, Bashar al-Assad and have him replaced with a brotherhood sympathizing Sunni leader in Syria, which again has not happened. But more so than that, he's, he's isolated himself in the region with many of its successor regimes, as well as non-Arab states such as Israel, right? And he's basically become isolated, which has shut him out of regional power plays. I think if you look at some of the sort of moves made in this sort of isolationist landscape that he's pursued, for example, Egypt has managed to re resurrect itself amongst the, you know, with, with, with the West as well as the regional, with, with the region as becoming a stable, you can call it an authoritarian state or whatever, right? But the, the Sisi regime has reestablished ties with the United States, is, is again once a major sort of actor, and has reached a numerous sort of cordial relations, not least the world with Israel, right? And Israel has not been sitting idly by since Erdogan has torn apart its relationship since the early 2010. Since the signing of Abraham Accords, Israel essentially has much more sort of friends in the Muslim world. But more so than that, if you look across the Levant and, and North Africa, these states have essentially cooperated to build something called the East, East Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, resulting in things like the delimiting of maritime borders, signing of gas agreements, in sharing of, of, of territorial sort of uh, and, 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 and maritime entities such that they can extract natural gas resources from the, the ocean bed and, and, and hopefully ch channel that to European sources, m make money from that, but also, uh, you know, develop independent energy sources that sort of frees them up from any sort of 
dependence on any other entity. And meanwhile, Turkey has become isolated. It's not a part of the East Mediterranean gas form. It's completely isolated. And Erdogan has sort of realized that in 2022. So he's begun this sort of charm offensive of rapprochement in terms of saying, okay, well, he hasn't exactly said mea culpa, but he's basically said, well, it's time to turn a fresh leaf. You know, this whole sort of transactional, as you say, you know, U-turn. You know, he's basically shaken hands with the Egyptian president. He's reappointed ambassadors with Israel. And he's become friends with the UAE because, you know, they're likely to buy up much more assets inside of Turkey. We'll have to see where that goes regionally, but it's quite a positive outreach in the sense that at least at some level he's realized that, you know, just become making enemies of everybody and tearing apart relationships has cost him dearly. Um, and it was a zero-sum game to begin with. But whether he can truly rebuild substantive ties with these regional powers, I'm a little skeptical of, but we'll just have to see. Uh, he's also uh, hugged Crown Prince bin Salman in Saudi right. Arabia for what that is worth. You mentioned the gas fines and the potential for even bigger gas fines in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, Lebanon and Israel have reached an agreement on uh, where where they can extract gas from. Yep. But is is Erdogan going to continue to be the spoiler there because he's made rather extravagant claims for Turkey there and irritated, uh, well, of course, Cyprus and, uh, of course, Greece in a major way, uh, but others. It, will he make peace in that area and, and to limit his claims to something more reasonable? We don't know. I mean, what we can say is since that sort of escalatory sort of rhetoric that, that you allude to began in 2019, really sort of uh, many thought this was an election tactic that it really did, you know, serve Erdogan well by sort of rousing voters at home when he said, you know, like, we don't recognize the territorial waters of Cyprus or Greece. You know, these are our waters and if necessary, we'll take them over by force, whatever. And he sent out drilling ships, escorted by the Turkish Navy, to the chagrin of the European Union, but also regional powers. Since the election timetable began about a year ago, that antagonistic sort of behavior in the seas has kind of stopped. Now, ideally, he probably wants to be a part of these Mediterranean gas forum. He would like to be a part of that because, yes, he gets a lot of his natural gas from Russia as well as Iran and to a little small degree from northern Iraq. But I think he would like to be able to sort of cooperate and have a piece of the pie of East Mediterranean gas. But that that I mean, that, that that's a huge leap because that would require essentially bridge building and normalizing ties with Cyprus, which the Turkish government doesn't recognize right, as an independent state because of the divisions on the island between the Turkish North and the Republic of Cyprus, which is essentially recognized by the rest of the world. I mean, that's, that's a big ask, and I don't think Erdogan's willing to do that. So I don't necessarily know how he gets into this, to, to the gas forum established by these regional powers. But for now, at least, he seems to have stopped his antagonistic behavior. I don't think he's ever going to back down from these claims that, you know, Turkey's territorial waters expand much more than the sort of law of the seas allow. But how he goes about that, I'm not quite sure. He could go to arbitration in international courts, but I'm not necessarily guessing that he's willing to do that because he could lose that. So up until now, just the fiery rhetoric and sort of this brazen and belligerent sort of acts, such as sending out naval ships, escorting sort of drilling ships has served him well. But for now, it seems that he's sort of tamped down on this on this sort of uh, rhetoric. I just, it's, it's just, just hard to see how he's, where he's going to go with this. Now, one big uh, election issue, Sinan, that has international ramifications are the refugees in Turkey, of which there are some 3.6 million, uh, mainly Syrians. So these refugees, of course, are an irritant. It's a big burden for any country to bear. But on the other hand, Erdogan takes advantage of the very cheap labor that these, these refugees supply in, in these construction projects, which you mentioned earlier. On the other hand, I believe, and you can correct me if this isn't right, he is suggesting in regularizing relationships with Syria's Bashar al-Assad, who has frequently, who recently was re-welcomed, welcomed back into the Arab League, of trying to find a way to normalize relations with him so that these Syrian refugees can go back and he has suggested that Turkey might be willing 
to build tens of thousands of houses in northern Syria to attract them, to get them out of the country. On the other hand, in the past, he has played the presence of these refugees as a threat against Western Europe or the EU, that he'll unleash these refugees through the Mediterranean, as he did once before, when a million of them went through Greece and into the rest of Europe. Do you want to talk about that issue a little? Sure, yeah. I mean, the Syria issue is huge, and and it's one of the biggest foreign policy challenges facing Erdogan, because it has so many implications across across the country's sort of world standing, even regional standing. So look, Erdogan's lost big on the Syria front because, you know, he's now in a position where he has to basically find a way to normalize ties with Syria simply because Assad is going to stay in power and the Russians are pushing both Erdogan and Assad to shake hands. Assad has been waiting him out, as in like, Assad is in no mood to please Erdogan anytime soon because he just wanted to see who's going to win the Turkish elections before negotiating with whoever it is. And he's taken that position because Erdogan's tried to basically overthrow him for the last 10 years. But the Russians aren't, you know, going to permit that. And and also, they also want Assad to, do, to deal with Turkey. So there are a few things. Inside of Turkey, the refugees close to 3.6, 4, 4.5, who knows, is not necessarily even an accurate count anymore. That's a major problem as far as Erdogan's concerned, simply because Turks are, are just fed up. They're incensed with this number of refugees, not because they're just number, they're just refugees, but the way in which the government has basically taken in these people without any sort of mitigation strategies in terms of how you house and settle them or contain them. They're essentially just free to roam around the country and people are angry about this because up, you know, they, they blame the, the refugee population for say, taking a sizable chunk out of the government's sort of social welfare program, saying that they have an unfair uh, uh, sort of access to these programs above and beyond Turkish citizens. Whether that's true or not, it's immaterial, right? People are angry and Erdogan has to solve this. So one thing he's basically said is, well, he's going to send them back. I don't know how that's feasible. Construction of houses inside of Syria is one thing, but is Assad going to allow that? Maybe. Erdogan would like a a piece of the pie of Syria's reconstruction, but that's not necessarily something that Mr. Assad is compliance or willing to do i mean why would he throw erdogan a bone where erdogan profits uh, uh uh you know economically out of this relationship the only one answer i can think of is look turkey shares the longest stretch of syrian border that will allow that will facilitate the you know shipment of major materials that it will need for its reconstruction a lot of those materials whether it's concrete steel or whatever will have to transit through turkey so at some level Assad and Turkey, Erdogan have to agree, and and Assad knows this, right? So some, you know, it's just, you know, this is a realization of that. Now, what will each want? So Erdogan will want some sort of accommodation for the return of refugees of some member. How I don't think he's going to be able to return all 3.6 or 4 million of them because most of these people don't want to go back. Some of them are residents, some of them are citizens, some of them were born in Turkey in the last 10 years, right? But in return for that, if some number of residents, uh, refugees are settled back into Syria, then Erdogan will say, well, OK, then I need something from you. I would like part of the reconstruction pie. I want you to do something about the Syrian Kurds that have been supposedly fighting ISIS, which I consider to be terrorists. What guarantees are you going to give me that I can sell to my people for saying that they will not pose a terrorist threat to Turkey? Because he needs to be able to sell that to his population saying he won in Syria right? It's a high wire act of negotiation. And I expect those to sort of get on the way in the next, you know, weeks and months, because we now have a new foreign minister, and that will have to be settled. But I think the specter of Syria is something that has to be solved. And one of the things that Assad will want in return is the removal of Turkish military uh, troops out of Syria in return for anything that Erdogan gains out of that. So it's going to be very transactional. But I expect some sort of accommodation and compromise to be reached in, in, in the next 12 months. So now in our little remaining time, we, we've got to address the, the big issue of Turkey's relationship with Russia and, of course, what that means for Turkey's relationship with NATO. As you mentioned in Syria, they were on opposite sides with Russia supporting al-Assad. So here we have the issue of the Ukraine-Russia war and the role that Turkey has been playing there. Could you mention that? This is a big sticking point. 
right now what we're seeing is, you know, the United States, but also the European Union sort of falling, tripping, on, tripping over itself to congratulate Erdogan following his election, re-election, simply because they have made, they feel, the United States, but also the European powers feel that they need Erdogan to essentially stay, stay the course. What I've been saying is basically is Erdogan's being the agenda setter in this, in this relationship with the West. He is actually running the actual agenda, right? Because the Biden administration is looking at Erdogan and saying, okay, you need to essentially help do what you've been doing for us up until now in the Ukraine front, which is, you know, you've been instrumental in selling the Ukrainians these combat drones, which have been helpful. You have helped facilitate the shipment of Ukrainian grain to the world, which has basically stopped a famine that would have likely killed 100 million people, right? You've closed off the Bosphorus narrow straits to Russian warships, which is not inconsequential, but you've also started at least nominally cracking down on illicit Russian financing, you know, and oligarch money finding its way into the global markets via the Turkish financial system. The US Treasury has weighed quite heavily on Turkey to stop put a plug, a plug a hole in that, and they have. So the Biden administration wants that to continue, right? And Erdogan in return wants, well, something in return from the United States saying, well, I need new fighter planes, right? Um, if you want me to continue, then I'm happy to play that sort of pivotal role, but I need something for you in return, right? And I want new fighter planes. And the U.S. is saying, well, for you to do that, for us to be able to sell you fighter planes, I need to remove congressional objections because I can't just do it myself as, as the president. Congress is blocking that. And Congress's biggest demand out of Turkey is saying, you need to basically lift your veto or lift your basic, you know, stalling of Sweden's accession to NATO, Right. So there's this sort of dance going on on, 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 that, on that side. But as far as, you know, Turkey's relationship with Russia, and he's playing on this too, right, is Erdogan is not willing to burn all bridges with Russia. He's got a very lucrative relationship with Russia. The Russians are about to open and complete construction of Turkey's first nuclear power plant, right, which is about to become operational. And that will be entirely 100% staffed by Russian operators. And it's 100% Russian owned at this point. Turkey is essentially beholden to the Russians importing a sizable chunk of its agricultural exports, which results in massive revenue for Turkish farmers. Turkey is very dependent, asymmetrically dependent on Russian natural gas for its domestic needs, as well as tourism revenues from Russian tourists, which come to Turkey every year historically. So Erdogan's basically saying, I'm willing to help the West out, but I can't just burn all bridges, right? So you need to help me out. And, you know, I, I can play this sort of what, you know, this hedging role, I'm not going to have, you know, I'm not going to be 100% in the Western camp where I pose all a barrage of sanctions against Russians because I can't do that. But then on the other hand, I will essentially ensure that, you know, I can do, I can, you know, toe the line of Western sort of interests to a point. And the Biden administration feels that's absolutely key to maintain. And that's why I say Erdogan's the agenda setter because he feels he holds all the purse strings in his hand. And on the European side, you know, the, the president of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, basically, again, showered platitudes upon Erdogan's re-election re re simply because all the European Union cares about for now is they don't want any refugees. And Turkey has agreements and serves as a bulwark, a bar barrier, a, you know, a buffer state between the Middle East and the rest of the, you know, what European Union on its borders in preventing Syrian refugees crossing into, in, into, into Europe. And they, that's all they care about right now. And so Erdogan has this sort of very advantageous position. And I should also mention in the last weeks, as we've seen, violence has started to erupt in the Balkans again, anomaly in Kosovo. And Erdogan's basically said, you know, if you want to help stabilize that situation, you will need me as a NATO power because Turkey already had peacekeepers in Kosovo since the, the end of the conflict in the late 1990s. But they've just bol you know, bolstered that sort of military presence there by sending an additional 700, 800 troops to Kosovo. And we, you know, the West will absolutely need Turkey's presence, not least of all because the Kosovars welcome Turkish military presence because they trust them. And so Turkey can play upon its sort of this critical sort of role it sort of says it, it, it plays for the Western security interests. And in return, he will want, Erdogan will want some things in response. In addition to F-16s from Washington, he will also want the European Union to remain largely silent upon, you know, rule of law issues in Turkey. You know, the, the democratic backsliding, he does not want negative press from the European Union, right? He wants that to be sort of tamped down. And I think he'll get it because 
everyone feels they need Erdogan more than he needs them because he can, you know, pivot to the other side should he feel that he's not getting what he wants from the West. Does the very large Turkish expat community in Europe, principally in Germany, uh, play any role? I, I believe it was reported that they they were very pro Erdogan and voting for him in this last election. Yeah, I mean, of all the foreign votes that uh, you know, of all that that took place, that you know, people who voted overseas um, in the Turkish elections at embassies and consulates. It, you know, it's not a big change. About two thirds of that, close to two thirds of that vote is pro Erdogan. And most of those, as you suggest, you know, the bulk of those votes come from Germany, the Austria, the Netherlands, right, where there's a large sort of working expatriate commu Turkish community, which is bro bro predominantly voting for Erdogan. And the Europeans are keenly aware of this, too. They understand that. And uh, I think, you know, it's hard for them to just all be about all values. Because the European sort of heartland is confronted by this Russian aggression. They're already facing these pressures of what to do about Russia, how to expand NATO, how to ensure you know, the sanctity of European borders and NATO's borders. The last thing they want is to essentially you know, really hold the Erdogan government accountable democratically and push it all the way into the, into the, Russian, into the Russian camp. I think that they just say, look, if we push too hard and demand more things from Erdogan, he's just basically going to stop cooperating with us. And that will mean more troubles for us on top of the ones that we already have. So as you mentioned, Erdogan is going to get the best bargain he can for agreeing to the accession of Sweden to NATO. In the upcoming NATO meeting, one thing that's going to be discussed is NATO's future security relationship with Ukraine, with some leaders indicating that uh, Ukraine should become at some point a member of NATO. If that comes to pass, or at least the, the, the attempt to include Ukraine and NATO, will, will Erdogan play the spoiler on that one? I would say right now it's too early to tell. I think it, it's really, it, it very much depends what Erdogan wants to do with that. At this point, I'm not prepared to make a sort of judgment on because I just haven't seen what the new foreign minister as well as Erdogan have, have sort of put their mind towards. Turkey gets a lot by playing both sides in the Ukraine conflict. Whether Turkey would essentially back Ukrainian membership, I'm a little skeptical of because that would be a big snub to the Russians, which I don't think they want to do right now. I mean, Turkey's denial of Finnish membership, it took them about nine months to approve Finland's membership. Um, and ultimately they acquiesced, but they bought nine months of time for the Russians. They, 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 but more so, the, you know, more than time, it's so discord and, and sort of disagreement within NATO itself. And the price of, you know, the, the, the net gain for the Russians on that front alone is priceless. So I'm not sure if Turkey would be willing to essentially uh, back Ukrainian membership. My suspicion is they might hide behind, uh, uh, not altogether unreasonably, existing NATO rules saying basically to enter NATO, you can't have a border dispute. And clearly, Ukraine doesn't fall into that category uh, right now in terms of membership, simply because it does. So, it, but it's, it's hard to speculate at this point. Right. Maybe we could close uh, on the issue of uh, Turkish-Chinese relations. As you know, oh, I, I guess it was about 15 years ago, Erdogan referred to the suppression of the Uyghur Muslims in China as genocide. Uh, he hasn't used that word since then. Uh, he's silent about what has happened to the Uyghurs. Now, is that that's transactional? That's uh, what? Sure. what is, yeah. What does what does uh, Erdogan hope to get out of his relationship with China? Look, I mean. You know, when Sisi took over power in Egypt, he called him a dictator. And he said he knew he's got blood on his hands and Turkey will never deal with him. And then soon you see he's shaking hands with him on the sidelines of, of you know, of, of a summit. And uh, look, you know, Erdogan is not a man of principle. Erdogan basically is able to flip on a dime. Um, regardless of this, you know, what, you know, regardless of the situation, he basically looks to what his immediate interests are. And if people accuse him of duplicity, and you know hypocrisy then he doesn't care because he just basically says you know i don't care you know fine no, no, i got it wrong you know his relationship with the gulen movement back in the early 2010s that he walked away from saying you know after the coup attempt he said we were duped right and we were you know we were we, you know and, and you know 
he was thick as thieves with Gulen. And, and with the Uyghur front in China, I mean, it's exactly the same. And he was also, he had the same sort of saying uh, with Crimean Tatars in Ukraine, saying, look, we will not abandon them. We will not essentially let them, uh, you know, we will protect them. And that was in the following 2014 invasion of, of Crimea. And obviously Turkey said nothing because it's, it's just platitudes. Um, fact of the matter is, if there's going to be any sort of uh, monetary incentive or, you know, investment potential coming in from from China inbound to Turkey, um, you know, Erdogan would, would flip on a dime about anything. And he's not going to bring up the Uyghur issue simply because it's not doesn't serve his interests. Um, and, you know, he would also probably say, well, I'm not the only one. What about the rest of the Western world? What is everyone else doing? Is that, I don't see anybody like the United States or the European Union sanctioning uh, 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 China uh, you know, for abuse of religious sort of freedoms. I mean, we, we brought out the Magnitsky Act in the United States against the persecution of, of, of religious sort of entities in places like Russia. Why don't we apply that to China, he'll say. And he might not be altogether wrong. I mean, he might essentially, you know, be turning on his own words, but we, you know, in the West don't necessarily implement our sort of values to the same extent against China because we, you know, we import everything from Halloween goods to to Tupperware from China still, and we don't want to sort of poke that bear as long as we are we have that sort of dependence on Chinese trade, and so Erdogan basically feels that he doesn't really have anything to apologize for. Well, except of course for the the sanctions against um, cotton produced by what's considered slave labor uh, in Xinjiang by the Uyghurs. That, but anyway, that yeah, the um, you know early on. When there was such a discussion of Turkey as the model, uh, I recall Erdogan himself thinking, indeed we are, and our influence is going to seep eastward, not westward. And in our relationship with the Turkic peoples in Central Asia, we'll have a huge influence and we'll have an impact. That's pretty much gone by the wayside, hasn't it? Yeah, I think that I think so. Um, you know, Turkey has squandered um, certainly since 2016 the coup attempt um, and the centralization of power and the and the sort of you know the bashing of rule of law um, or pretenses of being any sort of model. I mean, it's 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 at this point just laughable to suggest that Turkey could be any sort of model for any country. The the Commonwealth of Independent States, you know, they've always been under undue Russian influence and proximity. And with the exception of Azerbaijan, I mean, Turkey is essentially has no influence in that part of the world. But then again, Turkey has basically no influence, um, you know, of values, so, so to speak, in any part of the world at this point. Um, and it squandered what little credibility that it started to build up in the late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2009, and basically become essentially a bastion of how not to sort of uh, run a democracy, but also a poster child of democratic backsliding. Uh, let me close with the question, uh, Sanan. Uh, what are you most worried about because of Erdogan's re-election? That's a good question. Um, two things. One is, given his usurpation of power, what does it look like five years from now? Is he going to try and... Um, sort of groom a successor. He's in ill health. I don't think he's going to be able to govern the country for a full five-year term. Um, there are all sorts of rumors floating around that his son-in-law, Sajjik Bayraktar, um, might be the groom, uh, the person that be, that is being considered. But can he groom and implement a, a successor, which then gets the obeyance of the state, the military, but as also, also the, you know, uh, the public? I, I'm skeptical about that. Um, the other thing I worry about is the political opposition in Turkey, regardless of, you know, whether they're part of an alliance of six parties or the main opposition party of Atatürk, the Republican People's Party. They don't seem to be essentially, even given what they face uh, in sort of an uneven playing field as political opposition, I also fear that they're not essentially using the opportunities given to them in terms of being able to focus anti Erdogan opposition not being able to safeguard ballot boxes, not being able to field the ideal candidate to essentially run against him and not basically mobilize public support. And I think that's, that, 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 that's also a huge problem uh, that sort of 
emboldens this regime um, going forward. But again, I'll end on a slightly positive note, uh, suggesting that, you know, Erdogan's time is limited based on his health, I think. And I also think just based on, based on the nature of Turkey's pluralist institutional composition, unlike Russia's, that he'll be able to name a successor and that successor gets the abeyance of the body politic. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time and I would like to thank our speaker today, Dr. Sanan Sidi, a non-resident senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies for joining me today to discuss what does President Erdogan's election victory mean for Turkey and the world. I invite our audience to also go to the Westminster Institute website where you will see our other offerings and lectures, many on the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, China, uh, Taiwan, Japan, a recent lecture on what are the causes of inflation and other issues. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley.